this the first class on positivity bias or is it no this is this is the second class all right so now did you again i'm going to ask did you post the first class so again, as I said to Yocheved, it's posted somewhere. Either it's on my Facebook or on Toro Direct. I gotta find it. Right now, I'm 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 Facebook Toro Direct. I'm gonna record it also. That's it. So it'll be both. So and, is that uh, Torah? Torah Direct. Either ToraDirect.com or or I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna silence everybody because there's a lot of background noise. So um, um, uh, it's either on Toby Direct or Zalman Book at uh, Zalman Book at Facebook. One of those two Facebooks. Uh, this today is on, on Torah Direct. I don't see Rachel on. Um, she wanted to again say something uh, for the class. I don't see her on, so we're, we're again going to miss her introduction. So that's the way it goes. I'm going to. Okay, so I welcome everybody here again to the second class of, of uh, Positively Biased. Um, just to say again that this class is generously sponsored by uh, uh, the Hayon, Lunder, and Horowitz family in memory and in honor of Baruch Yosef ben Shabtai ben Shmuel HaLevi, uh, our beloved Robert Horowitz, who loved coming to West Chabad West Boke Chabad, I know her father, and um, he did enjoy, you came uh, on, on Shabbos and Yontiv, and his Shama should only have an aliyah through the learning today. Also, sponsor Shmuley and Chani Safrin, in loving memory of Ramadche Tzvi Safrin, who always saw the positive in life. Both of these families donated 50 of these books, and, and, you, and uh, we gave out close to, 35 yesterday, and uh, we have still more, so you can come by and pick up a book. But now you need to call us up and we will get you a book and you will be able to enjoy this book with the classes that we're gonna go through, the six classes, and with uh, the book in general. It's yours to keep and enjoy and read from time to time. Okay, my friend, today is, is Gimel Tamas. And uh, it's the yard side of the Rebbe, the 26th yard side of the Lubavitch Rebbe. Um, so if it wasn't in the time of Corona, I would be actually in New York right now and uh, be at the oil of the Rebbe to be close to the Rebbe, self-understood. Um, but in this situation, we come close to the Rebbe by learning his Teda and uh, uh, by connecting to him through the learning of Torah and by learning his hayras, his way of life and the way he expressed it and wanted that people should be. This book, and we have to really thank Rabbi Mendel Kalmanson for writing this book because this is, I, as I'm reading it and I'm putting it together for this, uh, this half an hour, 40 minute class, I mean, this is truly a powerful, powerful book. He did an unbelievable job to, uh, to uh, express the Rebbe in such a powerful way, in a written way, that uh, it's just unbelievable. And, and, and it's, 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 everybody should read this book because the Rebbe was a leader of Am Yisrael, the leader of the Jewish nation. And a leader, you cannot be a leader without followers. You need somebody to follow you to be a leader. And the Rebbe was that entity who wanted that, not to give speeches and not to give, uh, to be a spokesman of, of, of Judaism. The Rebbe was a leader. He wanted to be somebody who would influence, impact and change an, an, another person. In Taylor, that's called a shepherd. Uh, the Moshe Rabbeinu and the Zoya was called a Raya Mehemna a shepherd of faith. The Moshe Rabbeinu and so to the Rebbe, shepherd, they were shepherds of flock who took care of their sheep, who wanted the best for, for, the, for the flock, for the Jewish nation, and, and were Mesa Nefesh for Am Yisrael. And they were advocates by God for the Jewish nation, and that's, that's what was their life. 
you know the Rebbe once said a sicha on, on, uh, on the ending of the Teda, and, he, and, the, and we know that the Teda ends with the Pasik, Lachal Ayad Achazaka, the Teda ends on, in Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verse number 12. It ends, Lachal Ayad Achazaka, the last verse, Lachal Amir Agado, and to all the great, the, the Torah is talking about the power of Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu. What was the greatest of Moshe Rabbeinu? Chala Yad Achazak, all the power of his hand that he brought all the plagues, all the Chala Meira God and all the wonders that he did, and Shasa Leini Yisrael that he did in front of the eyes of the Jewish nation. And that's the last words of the title, Leini Yisrael. That's how it ends off the title with the with the, with the eyes of the nation. And Nashi, the commentator on the Chumash, says, "What is the meaning Leini Yisrael to the eyes of the Jewish nation?" So Rashi says, Le'ini Yisrael means that Moshe Rabbeinu came to his heart to break the luchis le'ineim in front of their eyes. Right? Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Mount Sinai, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, received the Torah from God, received the luchis that God himself carved himself, came down the mountain, and he saw the Jewish people sin. They made the golden calf. He took it and he broke it. He, he for his own. A person that never did anything without a command by God decided on his own to do something. Something that was against self understood. The Hebrew told him, gave him this personally to the Jewish nation. Something that he was up there 40 days and 40 nights. Not eating and not drinking. He took these luchas, he smashed it. It came to his mind to do that. Shenema be'esh be'anechem. That the, the Torah says, and I broke it. Moshe Rabbeinu says that I broke it before your eyes. I'm reading the Rashi. And then the Rashi continues. And the Rashi says, V'yeskima das ha'kadosh baruch l'daytay. And God said to Moshe Rabbeinu, Thank you. Thank you. I didn't tell you to break the luchas. I didn't tell you to do that. But you know what? You did it on your own. And I thank you. Thank you for doing it. That you, you broke. And as she says, Asher means Yasher Koyach Shashibaita. I thank you for breaking the luchas. Moshe Rabbeinu comes down the mountain. He sees the Jewish people are sinning. They made a golden calf. He realizes that he has to do something that will protect the Jewish nation. That's going to be, he's going to stand up and be a, 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 a Sanege. He's going to be a person who's going to look at the situation and he's going to turn it into a positive thing. How can he do that? He took the luchis that the Abish to God does gave them and he broke it. And God says, thank you. Because the second you broke the luchas, so you, in essence, we need another luchas. And until then, the Jewish people did not sin. And that's why he broke the luchas. If you learn the Gemara, he says, because he broke the, the, the shtar, the document of marriage, they're not married. There's no, there's no law. There's no commitment, so they couldn't have sinned. He broke the luchas. Imagine, Moshe Rabbeinu. And this is the way we pray, this is the way we praise Moshe Rabbeinu. And the Rebbe said, that's a leader of Am Yisrael. That's what's called leadership. What's called leadership is not only to just follow what God commands, but to know what God wants of you for the Jewish people. And to go that extra mile and break the luchas, not for the just Jewish people, for the sinner of Jews. But those that made an eagle, made us a golden calf. Mishra Beinu has such a Abbas Yisrael, such a love for the Jewish nation, such a positive outlook on Am Yisrael that he did something on his own and God said, thank you. I appreciate it. Great job. That is, that was, that was I believe, the Rebbe, and that was, that's really what this whole book is about. You know, there was once a, 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 um, 
what they call the uh, a guy who works for the paper, an editor of the of the National Jewish Post. He came to the Rebbe, and he told the Rebbe, he said, "Our publication is independent and completely objective." And the Rebbe said, "You know, you might be independent, but are you objective? Every person has a bias of some kind. Can we be truly objective?" How we, do we have the capability of being totally objective? Or do each and every one of us have some kind of a bias in life? Whether it's the bias that in, in, in the environment that we brought up in, in the, in, the, in the education that we were given, in the community that we were brought up in, do we truly have uh, an, an objective view on things? Or do we have a biased view? You know, it says in the Mishnah, that be save upon him your face. So it meant that either you have an automatic bias, a positive bias, and you see everybody smiling, or you have to work on your bias. <laughs> you might not have that positive bias. You might actually have a negative because that's the way you were brought up. That's your nature. You you cannot fake it always. Some people, we are brought with a, ne a negative bias. We see things critical. We're always critical of everything. We always think things in the negative. So really, how do, how do we work on this bias? How do we uh, change if we have a negative bias to things and then we look at things in a negative way? How do we bend ourselves to the positive? And that's why I believe this book is truly a, a book of lessons because most of us are not tzaddikim, like the Labavitch Rebbe was, who was totally, and by knowing the Rebbe and by reading this, you can see that his basic, you know, the Rebbe was, he just looked at everything positive. He didn't have to work on it. It was just his natural way of life. And it was the natural way of his, of his soul that he looked at things in a positive way. And I'm gonna show you today how the Rebbe, how far the Rebbe went to look at things in a positive way, even though most of us and every one of us would look at this negative, the Rebbe looked at it positive. And the, and the lesson is, I believe, we should work on it at least, to look at it positive. I picked out four stories. If we're going to have the time, we'll say all four. But if not, we'll say two or three. I want you all to turn the page 70, 76 in your book, page 76. Yeah, page 76. No, it's not 76. It says spark seeker on the bottom on 76. Is that the one? No. My. No. This was not my my one that I picked. Um. Look at that. In so, my book, it's, it says it it all counts. Is that the one? No. Do you have the name of the story, Rabbi? Uh, the newspaper in the show. This, this story hit me so hard because I'm dealing with this issue myself. Yes, it's all, it all counts. That's the story. I read the story just now. Which one? It, it all counts. Someone Which referenced page? it. Which 76. Page? 76. It all counts. In How the my 76 be a different, a different story? Yeah, my wow. six is showing a spark seeker. Wow, you, maybe there's another edition. My right. copy is right. right. all counts. You're right. In one book, it all, one book, it all counts. In another book, Ivey, I better figure this thing out. Right. In the book that I got, I got yesterday, it's chapter, chapter six. It. It's chapter six. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. I we have. Oh, How do I know this guy is making two books? Okay, there, this must be a new edition. 
Oh, you very right. Top of exactly. six is page it's 76 or 60. I'm sorry. It's 76 or page 60. It page all, 60. Okay. That's the that's the story. I want it all to, counts. Page 60 in our book. Page 60 in the new book. It's page 76 in an old book. So oh you may. Okay, we're gonna have problems with the other one numbers too. I see. Okay. Uh page seven, page 60 in the new book. Did ever receive a letter from an individual in the course of his travels had encountered something that upset him. Specifically, he was protruded by a man in the far-flung community he was visiting who had come to Shul to make a minion. The Jew came to the Shul, Chabad House, but then proceeded to read his newspaper the, the entire davening. So he sat in the Shul, he sat in the Shul reading a newspaper. And he wrote to the Rebbe that he was very, uh, very shocked and it bothered him extremely that, the, uh, that he would do that. The Rebbe replied in a, in a letter, I see in this situation that the extreme Jewish attachment that one finds in every Jew, the Rebbe says, I look at it different. I see this Jew loving God. For here is a person who has wandered off to a remote part of the world and become so far removed, not only geographically, but also mentally and intellectually, as to have no concept of what prayer is or what a house of God is, yet one finds in him the Jewish spark. Or as al Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, expressed in his Tanya, the divine soul, which is truly a part of God. This divine soul, which is inherited in every Jew, seeks to as best as can. In the, in, in the case of this particular Jew, it seeks expression at least enabling other Jews to pray congregationally. And he therefore goes out of his way to help them and at the same time to be counted with them. Right. Oh, wow, that's amazing. We come to show, people talk, people don't behave in show, we get angry, we get frustrated. We might even scream at them. We might even embarrass them. We might even say we're not coming back to shul again. And here the Rebbe said the opposite. <laughs> judge him rightly, judge him favorably. I judge him favorably. I look at this Yid, I see the beauty of this Yid, and I don't see nothing negative in this, in this Yid. I see his beautiful neshama. This story alone is to stand on its own, truthfully. Because that was the Rebbe. The Rebbe would not take any negative. Sure, this Jew should learn what Yiddishkeit is. Sure, he should learn the beauty of a show 100%. But should we chase him out of the show? Should we make him feel bad? Thank God he's coming to show. Thank God he wants to be part of a show. Thank God he wants to be part of the Jewish nation. Should we not accentuate that? Should we not make that great? That was, that is something we all need to learn. We all need to learn this very important lesson to even to look at a person that's doing something in our eyes negative and to see that maybe he's doing an unbelievable positive thing and maybe by enhancing him and by praising him, he might go to the next level in his journey of Yiddishkeit. But the Rebbe went even much further than that. The Rebbe went much further than that. I'm going to have to uh, tell you the chapter and, and, uh, and the story because I think this is mixed up. Um, in the old, it's, it, it's okay, so we're going to have to, we're going to go now. I'm very sorry, but I didn't realize that the book's number has changed. Um, we are going to go now to chapter seven. We're going to still be in chapter seven. And on the old book, it's page 102. It's you can take a Jew out of the temple. This was an amazing sikha of the Rebbe. And the Rebbe changed 
the Gemara, the Rebbe changed the Gemara. I'm, I'm serious. I was by this Sikha myself. I have repeated the Sikha in my, in my Chabad house because it changed my, my whole look out in the Gemara. Something that I've learned, studied for many, many years and never looked at the Gemara in such a kind of a way until the Rebbe came and did it. And this is a story in the Gemara. The Rebbe spoke about this story. Can you, do you guys have it? Page 86. Page 86, thank you very much. Page 86 in the new book. <coughs> Page 86, you can take a Jew out of the temple. So here's the story. A particular fascinating example of the aspect of the Rebbe's positive bias was expressed during the Fabrengen, which he spoke about a woman named Miriam Batbilga. Alma relates. Now, everybody learned the Gemara, like, like you're going to learn the Gemara right now, and the Rebbe is going to change the Gemara. So the Talmud relates that Miriam Bas Bilga ban abandoned Judaism. She married a Greek officer and accompanied the Greeks as they stormed the Holy Temple. She was there with her, with her husband, the Greek officer, this Jewish girl, woman, married to this Greek officer, was there in the, er in, in, in the er era leading up to the story of Hanukkah. In that very moment, at one of the deepest and darkest national tragedies, as the Greeks were defiling the holy temple, the Gemara says the story, this is the Gemara story. She went and pounded on the holy altar with her sandal. She took, walked into the, into the Mesa Megdash. She went to the, to, the, to, the, to the Mizbeach. She took off her sandal and she hid it on the Mizbeach. And she turned to God. She said to him, wolf, Wolf, look at, in the Gemara, it's Lucas, Lucas, wolf, wolf, you consume the people's wealth, but you do not answer them in a time of their need. For this, right, that's a story. That's the story. About it. She turns to God. She says, where are you? Where are you when, when, when Jews need you? You're a wolf. Wolf, wolf. This is the Gemara. And the Gemara says, for this vile act, contempt, the utter disrespect, the sages punished their entire family. The Rebbe said this story, and he started to cry. He started to talk about Miriam Bas Bilga, this girl. The mother you mentions her name, Miriam, the daughter of Bilga. And this is the way the Rebbe learned the Gemara. Look at this way the Rebbe learned the Gemara. Be that it may. During a public gathering in honor of the anniversary of his mother's passing, which today is, is the Yards of the Rebbe, that was Bav Tishrei, the Rebbe spoke at length about Miriam Bat Milga and the meaning of her story. Miriam Adpris was not, a, not out of contempt, the Rebbe said. It was out of compassion for the suffering of her people. In a voice audible, strained by emotion, I was by the Rebbe's, by this the Rebbe was crying. The Rebbe broke into tears as he explained, despite the fact that she was intermarried and renounced the ways of her people, joined and even encouraged their enemy in all ways to the discretion of the temple. Upon reaching the innermost sanctum, sanctum, her innermost truth was activated and she was overcome with the feeling of an unbreakable bond between herself and her people. She cried out, what did she cry out? She cried out for the, for the Jewish nation. She said to the Abish, what are you doing to Jews? That was her cry. Her cry was not God, a negative, God, God, her cry was, why are you punishing the Jewish people? What are you doing to this nation? They're your children. Why are you doing this to them? This moved her to pr protest to God on their behalf even as her husband ransacked and defied the holy of holies. The Rebbe says, I look at this Gemara and I believe the Gemara wants to tell us about the greatness of a Jew. The Gemara wants to tell us the greatness of Miriam Bas Milga, that even though she was an intermarried woman and she was there with her husband, she felt the pain of Am Yisrael. She felt the pain of her, of, of, of her, of, of her brethren. 
Herein lies a profound message. It may appear that a Jew is cut off from everything Jewish. But the Torah says no. What you see is only superficial. The fact remains they will and always remain a Jew. As the Abishtayah Zalman of Ladit to the Alta Rebbe teaches, a Jew neither desires nor is capable of being separated of godliness, God forbid. Even after Miriam Bas Bilger apostatized and joined their enemy, what was that ultimately bothered her? Why is the altar not protecting it, people? After all this is said and done, she cried out in pain for a fellow Jew. So why did the Talmud tell us a story? Not God forbid to display, disparage a Jewish, a Jewish woman, but to the contrary, it teaches about the beautiful and unbreakable bond that exists amongst the Jewish people. The Rebbe changed the way Yidin learned the Gemara in 15, for 15, 2,000 years. Nobody has ever learned the Gemara in this way. Everybody has ever learned, whenever anybody had learned the Gemara, learned the Gemara, we disposed to spies, man, bless Bilga. Remember her name forever for negative. That was not the Rebbe. The Rebbe said, why would the Gemara do that? Why would the Gemara mention her name? If not, sure she did a terrible thing. Sure she did something negative. But in her negativity, you can reveal her essence. We can see the true essence of Miriam Basbilga. The true essence was that she was a Yid. She was yet in the Shama, and she cared about another Yid. And she cared so much that she ran into the, into the base of Mikdash. She took off her shoes. She hid the, she hit the Mizbeach, which is supposed to bring peace between the Jewish nation and, and, and God. And she said to God, what are you doing this to Jewish people? What an unbelievable, what an unbelievable way to change the meaning of the Gemara. The Rebbe didn't change the Gemara. The Rebbe didn't change the story. The Rebbe changed the, me the meaning of this story so that all of us would go away with, a, with a looking at the Gemara and realizing the positive message the Gemara wants to give. Why would the Gemara want to give 2,000 years of a negative message to the Jewish nation? But most of us never learned this Gemara. Let's go to, to this week's Pasha. Let's go to this week's portion. And here we see that Abba Oso looks at the Torah in a whole different way than most of us look at the simple portion. And I'm going to go back two pages. Um, actually, one page to the dynamic duo. Dynamic duo, page 84. It's a, a hundred in the old book. It's dust the page before. Dynamic duo. This is also an amazing thing, but the Debbie, the, way the Debbie looked. And I believe again, you see, I believe the Debbie wanted that, when, that we, should, we should learn this story. We should, this, sikh, this is also sikh of the Debbie. And we should start thinking that way and start to look at the Torah in such a kind of a way, such a kind of a fashion. So we have the story in this week's Pasha, Pasha's Kairach. We find a lot of interesting people in this week's Pasha, Kairach himself. And we find a very interesting duo, Dasam Va'avidam. Dasam Avidam, you know, we know Dasam Avidam for a long time. If you learn the Torah, we know Dasam Avidam all the way from from the story of, of Moshe Rabbeinu when, he's, when he kills the, the, the Egyptian. And two guys start, and they tell him, and they do, to the Pharaoh. They tell on him to the Pharaoh. He has to run away from Egypt because of these two guys, Dosum and Avidam. And these two guys make him problems all the way until this week's passion. They make him problems left and right. 
every struggle that Moshe Rabbeinu has in the Torah, from then until this week's portion, these two characters, Dasan and Avidam, are there. They're in the center of every fight. The two colorful characters in Kairach's rebellion, in particular, have also singled out particular corrupt Dawson and Aviram, are regarded as a prototypical pair of invested troublemakers. According to the Talmud, they were wholly wicked from the beginning till the end. They are identified as two quarreling Jews in Egypt, right? Moshe Rabbeinu called them, it's in page 84, page 84, the dynamic duo. They are identified as two quarreling Jews. They are the cause Moses' flight to the desert by denouncing him to the Pharaoh for killing the Egyptian taskmaster and revealing that he had that he's not the son of the Pharaoh's door. They incited the people to return to Egypt, both at the Red Sea and when the spies returned for Canaan, they were the trouble. They were there always. They transgressed the commandment concerning the manna by keeping it overnight. When, when Moses says, you're not allowed to keep it overnight, there were two guys who kept it overnight, Dasana and Avedam. They accused Moses of bringing the Jewish people out of Egypt to die, as they said. They were the ones who, who, who told, told, who told the Jews, we're going to all die in the desert, and it's because of him. They uh, uh, th finally, in this week's Pasha, Dostan Avidim become ringleaders of the rebellion under the influence of Kairach, and they died in the result. Here comes the end of the story uh, that happens. Uh, it, it, but this is the story of Dostan Avidim. <laughs> But it's fascinating. Look at the Rebbe looks at the story of Dasa Vavidam, these two guys. The Rebbe explains, based on a classical commentary, so that a different picture emerges. Not that these two did not instigate any trouble. There were more to them than that. In fact, they had a point of goodness within them. While the goodness was generally muted, it nevertheless shone brightly on certain occasions revealing that beneath the layers of the rebellion, there exists a core of righteousness worth examining. Based on biblical commentary that ever says, Dawson and Avina were actually deeply involved Jewish leaders. Dawson and Avina were not simple people. They were one of the, one of the shaitim, when the Pharaoh had the taskmasters of the Jewish nation, they were the taskmasters. So they, and as the Rebbe says, although they had all the personal failings mentioned above, they were also part of a group of Jewish officers who risked their lives to combat the challenge power by, in, by seizing to provide the Jewish slaves with straw and their bricks. They cried out to the Pharaoh saying, why do you do this to your service? They were, we know the taskmasters took a lot of abuse for the Jewish nation. They were not like, those stories of the capos of uh, what we stories are told mostly, but these the taskmasters and by the Pharaoh took a lot of abuse. Furthermore, they were among those officers willing to take the beating for the Jews when they did not fill their quotas. And the officers of the children of Israel with Pharaoh taskmasters that had appointed over them were beaten, the Titus says. So they took a lot of abuse. So you have to know who they are, the Rebbe says. We know that they were Jews who stood up for Jews. They were not so simple. They were not so, and that's why Moshe Rabbeinu, you see, even in this week's Pasha, after 40 years, not 40 years, but after at least four years, five years of struggling with them, Moshe Rabbeinu shows them respect. He gets up to, re to go out to them. You imagine Moshe Rabbeinu in this week's Pashi, you know Dasa Avin, and it says, Moshe Rabbeinu gets up and he goes to them. He shows them some aspect of respect. And, and nobody knows why. Most people say, why, you, why, you, why, you, why would you get up and try to appease them? Because Moshe knew their greatness. Moshe knew that they had a lot of good qualities. Even in their negatives, they had some unbelievable qualities. 
And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu went to, went to them, a person who tried to kill him, two guys who tried to kill him, two people who constantly tried to dethrone him, who tried to get the whole nation against him. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't walk away from these two. He and Moshe Rabbeinu, this week's Pasha gets up and he tries again to go to them and says, Dasam Avidam, why are you doing this? Why? You know that it's not going to be a good ending. Why are you doing it? But they didn't want to hear him, as the Torah says. They ignored Moshe Rabbeinu. So their ego got to the best of them. But seemingly, you can live from Moshe Rabbeinu himself. And Moshe Rabbeinu shows an unbelievable wanting and a desire to reach out to these two guys. Moreover, they challenged Moshe and Aaron directly for making things worse for the Jewish people. As conditions rapidly deteriorated for them, as soon as Moshe started to investigate against, against Pharaoh, and the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have brought, this is the drush of Moshe of Dasma Vida in, in Exodus. Was into the foul out in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servant to place the sword, sword in the hand to kill us. They, they, were, they, were, they were against Moshe Rabbeinu. Indeed, Moshe Rabbeinu validates their claim by bringing their challenge to God. Moshe Rabbeinu sees right after that. He says to the Lama, why are you doing bad to this nation? So he brings their complaint to God. So read through the Rebbe's deepest insights. Despite their many shortcuts, Dasa Avidan also emerged as a vigilant guardian of their people, faithful protecting them from all potential threats, whether from within or from without. Moshe Rabbeinu, the Rebbe said, had a positive bias to Dasa and Avidan. People that were out to get him, and out to destroy him. And we know that Rebbe Osa had that positive bias. Because not everybody agreed with him. People came out against him openly. And there was a famous story of a rapper, actually, who came out vehemently against the, the Rebbe. And then after many years, wrote to the Rebbe an apology. And that the Rebbe, hopefully, is not carrying any grudges. And the Rebbe said, Chas Shalom. I have no time, I think, but I have no time to carry grudges against anybody. The Rebbe said we should learn the Pasha, even though you're going to learn this Pasha. And the Rebbe always talks about Kaira, but that's a whole different concept. And there's a, and it's actually in his book, Kaira also was somebody that Moshe Rabbeinu dealt with. But we talk about Moshe Rabbeinu, not Kaira, not Dosim Avidim. Moshe Rabbeinu had a positively biased by every Jew whether he was a sinner, whether he was a person that was against him, wanted to destroy him, what telltale on him to, to, to the Pharaoh, he imagine, and still Moshe Rabbeinu honored, because Moshe Rabbeinu himself, and the Rebbe says we learn from this, that Moshe Rabbeinu had an unbelievable positive bias to Jews that were sinners or even to Jews that were against him. And that's the lesson, what we need to learn. I want to try to give you one more story in this, in this book. In the old book, it's 86. So let me get the, uh, this is also amazing. It's actually the first one in this chapter, chapter seven. It's the first one. And we'll end it off, we're actually late already. This was also an amazing, I very spoke about this in the synagogue many times. Chat page 70. We'll end off with this. Uh, I'm, um, Alicia Ben Avuya, another villain of the Talmud. I mean, but the beauty, the beauty of the Rebbe, whenever he had, whenever he came out positive to somebody, he has he always had. You know, like 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 the story I just told you at Moshe Rabbeinu. Here we have also Lishan Avuya, who was a big troublemaker in the Jewish nation in times of the uh, the Tanoim Rameir. And um, and the Rebbe looked at the Gemara totally differently. 
So at least Shem Avihu was a Talmudic sage who went to become a famous heretic in the Jewish history. You can look up in the Gemara, and the Gemara has many stories about Elisha ben Abuya. He was called Acher. The Gemara gives him the name Acher, the other. Following his rejection and the repeated public desecration of Jewish law and communal norms, he was held in such contempt by the community that he was striped of his name and referred to as Acher, which means the other. Elisha ben Abuya was thus come to represent a particular fact archetypal other in the rabbinical thought and myth. A person who not only grows up within the community and chooses to leave and live beyond its borders, but a one who continues to flout and flaunt his apostate publicly. What's the beauty of this? What, so this is a terrible person. Not that this is not a person that, that was born as a, 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 a negative person. This is a person that was a great sage. Elisha Nabui was a great sage. And he came, he went away from, he went away from Yiddishkeit in a very bad way. You can look at the Gemara, I mean, a very bad way. He did terrible things. But even in the Gemara, there was a person that never gave up on him. His student, who was Rab Meir. However, as always, there was more to the story. The Talmud relates that one Shabbos, Rab Meir, was a man was a student, was walking behind Elisha Babuir. <laughs> I mean, if religious Jews would act like this today, you wouldn't find this. You know, you're walking behind the car of a, a you know on Shabbos of a guy who's driving a car. This was exactly what was happening. Just can you imagine a mayor on Shabbos walking Elisha Babuir? He's riding a horse on Shabbos. He's riding the source on Shabbos, and Arameya is walking. And what are they doing? They're talking the words of Torah. Arameya and Elisha ben Avoy. Arameya was the only sage at that time that didn't give up on, on Elisha ben Avoy. He was the Chabad rabbi of the time. He didn't give up on Elisha ben Avoy. The guy was walking on a horse on Shabbos, riding a horse on Shabbos. Arameya was walking next to him in public. We're not talking about a private, in public, they were walking in the middle of the street. At a certain point, Elisha Mavui stopped and pointed a main benefit that according to the counting of the steps, that Mishra Mavui was counting the steps of the horse. They said, you read Tchum Shabbos, you, you reached us, because in Jewish law, you're not to leave 200 Amis out of your, 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 your city limits. He said, we, we, we've gone out of the city limits. You, 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 you're not allowed to walk anymore. You have to turn back and go home. So as they reach the Shabbos boundary, and they should go, thus go no further, a most ridiculous display of rabbinical acumen and halachic sensitivity. So Elisha Vuya, they were talking in Torah. So they we're not talking about baseball, they were talking in the Torah. So Elisha Mavuya said, you, you gotta, gotta turn back. Isn't that amazing? Elisha uh, Mavuya turns, uh, turns around and says to the mayor, a mayor, <laughs> Ramea, it doesn't mean on the story of the Gemara, but Ramea turns to Elisha Mavuya and says, come back. Come back, uh, come back to, to Yiddish guy, come back. If you're so worried about this law, why don't you come back and be uh, from a Yid? So uh, Elisha Mavuya says, I would love to come back, but I was, I was driving my horse, the last Jim Kipper, I was driving my horse and I passed the base of Mikdash and I heard a verse come out from from the Holy of Holies that said, Shuvu Banim Shuvuavim, I'm begging my children, please repent. Puts me Acher besides Acher. <laughs> so I heard from heaven that God said, I can't repent. Imagine. So uh, May had told him, nevertheless, he could repent. Every Jew can repent. So the Rebbe says, you understand this, we see expressed in the brief Talmudic vintage the numerous shades of, ex of uh, existential complexity that exists simultaneously within each human identity, making it all more difficult to one-dimensionalize and judge the character or worthy of an other from our finite perspective. 
So how are we supposed to read this story? In 1982 at a Fabrengen, on Shabbos Zemer, the Rebbe referred to Elisha ben Avua and his student Rameya, citing that the inclusion of the teachings of Elisha ben Avua in Pirkei Ovis and Ethics of Our Fathers, the Rebbe juxtaposed Elisha ben Avua's teaching with a quote from Rameya, which appeared in a close proximity to Elisha, reading them both through this lens of their complex personal biographies. Reflecting on this inner journey and struggle, Elisha ben Avud taught, he who studies Torah as a child, to what can he be compared to? To ink written on a fresh paper. And he who is Torah Torah for an old man, to what he can be compared to? To ink written on paper that has been erased. In the context of his story, the Rebbe suggested, that despite the outward appearance of Elisha ben Avud, totally disavow of the ways of Torah, his, his prodigies, Torah study, is still present in some level. And that no matter how far he may go, he carries an imprint of wholeness deep, deep within him that it can never fully erase. Similarly reflecting on his own experience as one who continues to learn from such a heretic, Ramea teaches, look not at a vessel but look what it contains. This explains how Ramea was allowed to learn teachings from Acher because Ramea did not regard the vessel, rather what was contained and accepted a teaching of Acher had learned as a child, which remained from its entire entity uh, for, uh, for eternity because it was the ink written on fresh paper. In the Rebbe's teaching we see following in the footsteps of Ramea, an exalted sage of Israel who never gave up on the incorporeal soul of an other, no matter how far they may have strayed from the canoe. I bring these three stories, story of the newspaper, story of, of, of Dasim Avidam, and ultimately the story of Elisha ben Avuya. Now we need to learn, and the Rebbe would always say, it doesn't make a difference if you are not a tzaddik, so you don't have this positively bias in your nature, but the Gemara tells us these stories because we should learn from these stories, and we should learn how to become more positive, even with people that we would never ever think that we should have any positive thoughts about them. We should surely have positive thoughts. Therefore, the Mishnah says, nobody should judge another person. The only one who can judge another person is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is God himself. I'm finishing, I had another one, but you can continue reading the book. And the story I really wanted to also read is, is the Kaidach, and you should read it because it's connected to this week's Pasha. It's the, the one on Kaidach, and what was Kaidach's, well, well, how, the, how the Rebbe looked on Kaidach. So it's also in this chapter, this chapter, chapter seven. I wish you all a wonderful day, a happy day, a healthy day. And I'll see you, Mitch. Shem. Today is Gimel Thomas. Let us connect to the Rebbe in any way we can. We just connected by learning the Rebbe's attitude in Gemara and the Rebbe's attitude to, to Taita, which you won't get this anywhere else. I can, I can promise you. And therefore, we should really connect to the Rebbe in this day of Gimel Thomas any way we can by having positively bias in our life. God bless you. Have a wonderful Amen. and a happy day.